Welcome back to Bridges. Uh, my name is Donnie Miller. We are talking about the importance of mental health care and what we can do to destigmatize that care with our guests this morning, Dr. Janice Woodworth and Bill Emma Heiser. You know, once we get through, um, once you get through the crisis, whatever the, the crisis is, or for those people here um, watching us today who may have just been traumatized by what they saw mm -hmm. on, on TV, um, you know, I, I think I was one of those. I am not a, a crier by nature. It's, it's, my daughter tells me I just somehow didn't get that gene. Um, but I found as I was watching that show, you know, the tears were starting to flow and you, you really didn't quite know where they came from. I didn't quite know where they came from, but they were very much there. And I'm sure that I was not alone in that. I'm sure there were lots of people who were traumatized just by watching it. Um, thinking about that, you, you can't begin to imagine what people who are actually going through that mm -hmm. feel or what kids feel who happen to turn on the TV and see it. How do we get through that? I worry about families that have uh, experienced other traumas. We know mm -hmm. kids that experience multiple traumas are more susceptible to the damage and y children, especially young children, when they're watching um, things on TV, they don't know that that's not, that thing isn't happening over and over again. Mm -hmm. They don't know that it's happening in Connecticut, not happening in Toledo. So the risk to kids, you know, sort of being cons consuming a lot of media is that they will become more and more frightened on understanding what's going on. Mm -hmm. And I, I, parents have a, I, have a real um, responsibility to help limit their children's access to media. I was going to ask you, is, is that the way to do it? Do we just turn off the TV, but then you go to school and, and the, the, the child in the next seat has parents who left him, you know, with free reign to the TV so he sees it. So, I, yeah, I wondered about that. I think it really depends on the, the developmental age of the child, right, and how much exposure they should have to this kind of information. Uh, a, a younger grade school child, uh, you know, we would consider limiting significantly and maybe having a discussion about it because they are going to hear about it at school. They are going to hear it from their friends. Um, and uh, I think that opens up an opportunity to have a dialogue about mm -hmm. these issues, right, mm -hmm. and, and safety and about, uh, again, about mental health and about um, the feelings that they're having. Um, and certainly, I think uh, we don't, in the mental health community, I think we give a lot of credence to vicarious traumatization, yeah. right? Somebody who witnesses something, they weren't really part of it uh, firsthand, but they yeah, witnessed it. That's, and that's right, really, folks watching TV. That's the phenomenon that you're talking about. Right. And certainly, I think uh, for a family that is experiencing that, there are some things that they can certainly do. I think the first thing uh, is, you know, people need to be able to talk about it because it's very difficult to make sense of. And I think the first thing we do. And what's that conversation sound like? Well, you know, what's it sound like? How are you feeling? What do, what do you think about this? Okay. What are, um, you know, what are, when you witness that, can you explain or describe, you know, what you felt in that, in that moment, what you were thinking about? Mm -hmm. Because as, as you said, you watched it and the tears were coming and you weren't even sure why, right? right? right. But still that had an emotional impact on you. And to be able to express that and start talking about that a little bit more in the family setting. And certainly if you start seeing uh, this persist, um, that we would want to look at, you know, seeking out professionals to assist uh, with processing that on, on a more in-depth uh, basis. And I think parents need to, as you point out, parents need to be kind to themselves and recognize that they're having an emotional reaction to what's going on and kids will pick up on, kids will be as, as well as their parents are. Mm -hmm. So if a parent is unable to have that conversation, you know, calmly, then I think, you know, having the adult talk to another adult or wait until they can you know, be calm and comforting to their children is really helpful. Most kids, for most kids, the safest place they have is at home. And the reassurance that, that you are safe in your own home and that you have adults that, that are keeping you safe, I think especially for younger kids, um, goes a long way to helping kids um, recognize that, that although bad things happen, it's not going to happen to them. Um, there are some kids who are not safe in their own homes, and that becomes a problem. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, the reality is, if we're talking about kids, there are kids around this country that see violence mm -hmm. of an extraordinary nature every single day, mm -hmm. every single day in their lives. And, and we, again, expose them to a vicarious sort of violence. Every time we turn on, we allow TV that's unsupervised or video games that are unsupervised. So. Should we be having this conversation with kids all the time, whether 
they're, you know, not necessarily initiated by a, a Newtown incident? Should we be talking to them about, about safety and feeling okay? And well, uh, safety for sure. And I think there's been some incidences in Toledo where there, you know, there's been some shootings. Oh, and absolutely. And there's been, um, and some of those incidences, I'm sure it's true for you too, have touched some of our clients. Even, um, you know, there was a, a child several years ago who um, was hit by a school bus. Mm -hmm. And you know, and kids were dying in um, that their friends and, and schoolmates are aware of. So there's a lot of exposure um, kids have, even one-on-one, -on -one, um, and in their community to violence that I think oftentimes goes unaddressed. Absolutely. Yeah, and what happens when we don't address these issues? I mean, if we just sort of say, oh, you know, that was, that was out there, that, was, it, that wouldn't happen in, in our neighborhood. But what happens when we don't address it? I think there are a lot of different consequences when we don't address, you know, trauma in general. Um, typically what happens is if it's not being discussed, if it's not being addressed, if it's not being treated, um, you know, people tend to become either desensitized to it mm -hmm. and, um, and just feel as though that's kind of how it is. Um, and therefore sometimes cut off their ability to empathize with others mm -hmm. and sometimes act out in ways that might harm others, mm -hmm. right? Or just not even consider other people's feelings. Mm -hmm. And then the mm -hmm. flip side of that, then you have people who it does bother them, they internalize it and it becomes, you know, they look for escapes, sometimes drugs, alcohol, mm -hmm. um, you know, um, relating to, you know, and finding other outlets to deal with that when we're not focusing it uh, in a treatment mm -hmm. uh, and, and through treatment. Mm -hmm. So we have to be careful uh, when we don't address it because we have at least one of these two and I'm sure there are other ways that kids could respond but these are two basic ways that individuals um, you know might respond to trauma that's not being addressed. Well mm -hmm. the kids that, that internalize or don't come to the attention because they're not they're not causing behavior problems. It's the kids that are you know getting kicked out of class that are causing behavior problems at Absolutely. home than the kids that are brought into treatment. So we're only we're only seeing a, and this is true across across all mental health issues a very small percentage of kids that are that are exhibiting mental health problems, probably, I think I think nationally it's 10% mm -hmm. of people with really? a mental health diagnosis um, are receiving treatment. Wow. Um, and, I th and there's there's some research that suggests that, that aggression um, in kids is oftentimes a function of emotional stress, d depression, anxiety, um, and that's and that's not the way it's treated. You know, I'm really glad you brought that up because I was going to ask you if there are things, if there are signs that we should look for specifically in children. Let's just talk about kids mm -hmm. at this moment, but specifically in children um, that would indicate that they are having some internalization of mm -hmm. issues, that they are having some s trauma related um, symptoms. Well, oftentimes, um, you know, there are some hallmark uh, symptoms for trauma like nightmares, um, you know, but we also see that manifest itself in uh, symptoms like anxiety in, in situations, uh, social situations, uh, nervousness. Um, sometimes it comes out as acting out behavior. Mm -hmm. A lot of times it comes out and looks like depression, mm -hmm. uh, you know, where the child becomes withdrawn and isolated um, and, you know, less connected to uh, the friends and activities. Mm -hmm. They don't have interest in uh, and doing activities that they normally would prior mm -hmm. to the traumatic event. And mm -hmm. the little ones, mm -hmm. um, littler ones, mm -hmm. I think demonstrate a re reaction to trauma a little bit differently. Oftentimes you'll see regression. Kids that have been mm -hmm. toilet trained are, are not. Um, they also have trouble sleeping. It can become very clingy with their parents. Um, you're afraid to let their parents leave the house. Um, start talking in more a more babyish voice than perhaps they had really? been. Mm -hmm. Really? Um, and that, those, those signs I think are, are are important for parents to attend to. So if I if I see those those signs in my child, is there something I can do at home before I call either of you? Is there something I can do to turn that around before I call either of you? I would say if you're seeing those kinds of symptoms, uh, oh. I'd call. You know, worst case scenario, and here we were talking about stigma, right? And we know we were talking about uh, mental health as a as a as a medical issue, right. and we know that if you 
uh, have early detection and prevention of things such as cancer, right? The earlier you catch it, mm -hmm. the better the likelihood of the prognosis. And it's the same with mental health issues, is that if indeed you have a, a child that's demonstrating mm -hmm. some of these behaviors after a traumatic event, really have these behaviors in general that's on a prolonged period of time, mm -hmm. then it's best to get them screened early. Because mm -hmm. uh, worst case scenario is we say, all right, you know, this is a developmental thing, this is something that we uh, that we can give uh, information to the parent to, to take care of. Mm -hmm. And then again, it might require some professional assistance and some professional mm -hmm. help. So what if I don't have insurance? Well, let me go back just for a second so right. the parents can do at home. Okay. Um, because I, I do think that there's a vast majority of kids who experience trauma, have a short-term reaction to it, and then are fine, um, that don't have any long-term effects from it. What seems to help some families and some kids when they've experienced a trauma or seen a trauma, something like this, is to, help, is to encourage them to do something to help. You know, the classes that send cards, you know, to, yeah. to the parents of the victims. Um, yeah. plant a, do a memorial, plant a tree. Yeah, you know. one of the local schools made uh, snowflakes, I saw. The exactly. Other day. Yeah. And that can really help kids process um, a traumatic event. For p parents who don't have insurance, there's there are resources in the community that can help families, churches, uh, community centers. Um, there are agencies that have sliding scales for mental health, for mental health services. Yeah, sliding scales are, are um, uh, determined payment based on ability to right, pay. That's right, right. Yeah. And, and you know, and, and again, uh, depending on their financial situation, I mean, we're very fortunate in Lucas County to be one of, I believe, only two counties in um, in the state of Ohio that still have some funding for mm -hmm. individuals without insurance. And so, you know, the the the, the board here in Lucas County um, does have some funding for folks. And I, I'm not yeah. going to say it's a lot, but it's yeah. certainly there is something that's better than you know the other. Yeah, the Lucas County Mental Health Board you're talking correct. about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and so there are some uh, opportunities for folks, but I will say this on the, with regard to trauma, a lot of times, and this is perhaps a barrier that, um, that's, that's a system barrier, and that is oftentimes trauma, we in mental health find trauma to be a, a paramount issue that needs mm -hmm. to be addressed, and we know it's, it can be cyclical, it can be lifelong, it can come back through developmental stages throughout life, um, and um, unfortunately, a lot of times insurance providers don't see trauma as, they, they want to see a secondary diagnosis like depression or anxiety or some other diagnosis. And so oftentimes that is supposed to be the primary. And if they don't have that, then technically they, issue. that's right, yeah. they don't really qualify for yeah. services at that point. We're going to have to let that be the last word, but I would think that the message we want to leave them with, it, um, folks who are watching today, is call. Um, somebody will help you figure it out, but call. Don't be afraid to call. Don't be afraid to call. We'll be right back in just a moment. Please stay with us.